Hello and welcome along to the Unplugged Pod, where each week we explore absolutely everything to do with switching off in a world that's always on. I'm David, and as ever, I'm alongside Hector Hughes, Mr. Unplugged himself. And this week we're joined by Harrison Osterfield. Harrison is an actor, he's a model, and he runs two businesses, including Carbon Fingerprint. I hope you enjoy. The Harrison, first of all, thank you so much for coming along uh, Happy to, be here. to the Unplugged Pod. Uh, really appreciate your time. We'll start with the big question. How do you unplug? How do I unplug? Uh, yeah, I was thinking about this. I find it really difficult to unplug. Um, when I think about, and also what does unplug mean? Are we talking about just like disconnect from technology completely? Or are we talking about just in general, just like vacant mind? Yeah, what does it, what does it mean to you? I think I think it is probably that complete uh, switch off of everything, not just digital, but just being actually relaxed and not thinking about everything. Because there'd be times where I'll unplug from my phone or I'll leave my phone at home and I'll go for a walk, but then my mind is just constantly moving and I'm like, I've got to think about the next thing for this business or acting or whatever it is. So when actually when I completely switch off, it's quite rare. And I would say it's probably usually the time after the walk if I like... I've been on a walk and then like ideas are flowing and I sit down and then I have like a coffee or something. And then that's the sort of time to hopefully be like looking around somewhere nice and be like, this is okay. I'm chilled now. I've, I've, I've worked up the kind of ideas and everything on the walk and now I'm, I'm relaxed afterwards, but it's very rare. I would say. Yeah. Cause you're, I mean, we were talking beforehand about just, just how busy a man you are these days. I mean, is that a recent phenomenon or have you always, I think I've always wanted to like explore all lots of different opportunities. Um, even with acting, like to start with, I knew that like, I was not going to be able to just sit back and wait on like wait by the phone and wait for stuff to happen. Because as an actor, you, you are really kind of just waiting for someone to kind of give you the job. So for me, it was all about kind of building networks. So like I would go to a lot of events um, and build up a network of trying to meet directors or actors, creatives. And then when I was at home, I'd like watch a movie every night. So I had like a big bank of movies. I mean, it sounds sounds pretty easy. Now I think about it, like have a big bank of movies. Like, wow, it must be so tough. You must have such a tough, busy life. But that was the start. So I was always, I find it very difficult to just sit still and, and do nothing. And when you say that, are you like, are you kind of analyzing the movie? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be like, what, what's the performance? Like, because when you go to these meetings with a director or a casting agent or an agent, what you're going to be talking about most likely is either TV or film. So if you've got like a backlog of all the films that you like for whatever reason or don't like for another reason, you've got like a big plethora of stuff that you can talk about and make it a lot easier. Um, that's why I justify it as whether that's, <laughs> whether that's true or not. Um, but that was the kind of idea behind having a big bank of stuff and then analyzing it each time. I and mean, that's also another thing. So I go to a movie now and I find it really hard to switch off because I'm like constantly picking it apart. Um, Busman's holiday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then, but then that will be no when I really like a movie because I will, I'm like, oh, I haven't actually thought about it. I've just been watching it. What, is there anything recently that's, that's done that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oppenheimer, actually. Okay, last, yeah, yeah. That was the best cinematic experience I think I've ever had in my life. Because uh, my, my housemate was like, I'm not going unless we have these specific seats in the IMAX. And I was like, it's booked up for like three months, bro. Like, we're going to be waiting for ages. I really want to see it. He's like, nope, I'm not going. And I was like, fine, I'll wait with you. And I'm so glad we waited. We had these perfect middle seats in the IMAX. And it was like complete surround. And it was, yeah, the best cinematic experience I've ever had. As an actor, I, I was sure your answer to that was going to be while you're acting. Because I would have thought that is, even though there's a million screens on you, yeah. that's a moment where you are completely in the moment. I mean, obviously, you're, you're, you're free to define unplugging however you so wish. And you're probably the first guest to actually take that step back and, and define it. But how, how is it as an actor when you're when you're in the middle of I think that's a very yeah very good point actually and I I, something I probably overlooked like there are those moments where you completely like lose yourself and you are technically unplugged but even then it is still pretty hard when you've got a big cameraman sort of just like overpeering you and you can feel them coming closer so you really have to switch off in a way of not noticing what else is going on you've got 60 crew all watching what you're doing so and then immediately after and I'm like oh my God, was that any good? Got no idea. Let's go ask the director. So you're constantly like thinking about that. But um, yeah, it's a challenge and it's it's a fun challenge. And that's when it is those like real nuggets of moments where you completely like lose yourself and 
you're completely involved in the scene or the character, it feels it feels pretty good. And it feels like you're kind of vibrating at the end of it because it's just like a complete like encapsulating moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to throw you under the bus here, but you told me <laughs> last time we met that um, you find it easier acting and pretending to be someone else than doing something like this and yeah. coming on a podcast. Oh, and... yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is a character. This is an actual... <laughs> this, is, this is podcast man. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because there's a script or what? I, yeah, this is this makes me nervous because I don't know what you're going to ask and I haven't prepared it. <laughs> but no, I, I, it's, I've got better at it over time. Um but yeah, with, with character acting and like with a script, it's being something completely removed from me. And it's like, that's the fun part. And you can be someone else and, and tap into it. Cause I'm not very um, extroverted and talk about, you know, like, I don't know, feelings and things like that. So it's quite, it's quite nice to have an outlet where you can explore those kind of things um, and play characters and emotions that you wouldn't usually just talk about in day to day life. So it's been a real like learning process to, bring that into actually like my real life and make sure that I can still talk about lots of different things. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you mentioned walking is a method of unplugging. It might be a good time to, 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 to talk about the anecdote. So you have a, uh, a walking club in North London <laughs> where people yeah. don't bring their phone, correct? I wish, I, I, it's, it, we've done one. So it's, I don't that's know if a it's club. a club. Yeah, we're, we're in club, we're in club mode now. Okay, yeah, sure. We, yeah, we have a club. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, my business, uh, Carbon Fingerprint, which is all about sort of detaching from your phone and using your screen time for a better mm. world, basically. And we wanted to do these offline walks where it is sort of a digital detox for a couple of hours. So you arrive, you have a big box and you put your phone in there and then you won't have your phone for about three hours. And it was amazing the response that we had. We probably had maybe 30 people, I say, come to this one. And uh, it forced people to have like proper conversations. And like even because I know I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for it as well. Like if a conversation, you're at a pub or something like that, it sort of dies down a bit. You know, there's that bit of a lull. The first thing I'll do is I'll reach my phone and just, I don't know, check for, I don't know. I'm not even know what I'm checking anymore. It's just like a natural habitat. So when that's taken away from you, you go to reach for it and then you're like, actually, maybe I should make a bit of an effort and like talk about these conversations. And they're like positive conversations from it. And the feeling afterwards of just being not caught up in such a hectic, busy world was great. And yeah, the feedback was really good. So yes, we're going to do a lot more of them. So I guess it is a club now. But why wasn't Hector there? <laughs> that's weird yeah because he was invited uh, and uh, I didn't have my phone so I couldn't, be, I couldn't record him and uh, you can tell me what you can tell me what happened so I also didn't have my phone um, but I went to the wrong chief station so I was at Hampstead underground phoneless and they were all at Hampstead Heath uh, where the walk kicked off this from. is the slight problem where we need to be might be clearer with the instructions because then you have no way and it's an amazing feeling actually like I have no way of con contacting yeah, nice. you and I, I had a lovely walk in Hampstead Heath afterwards, so, you okay. know, but it, I would have loved to have done it with everyone else. I wouldn't say it's a problem even. No. I think it's a beautiful part of the package that, yeah, yeah. he's just such a purist that he, he sort of got lost. Uh, uh, yeah, he's just yeah. too much of a purist. Yeah, yeah. He does, <laughs> <laughs> he does the whole way. Texas didn't even, yeah, went on the wrong day. He's been going every day since. Um, but yeah. it's, it's crazy that that is unique. And it is unique. But it's crazy that it is, right? That like actually go to somewhere in London and leave your phone at home. Because I mean, most of us, we can probably navigate around like the, the tube. The tube system is very good once you've got to grips with it. But there's just this like fear of you know, Potential. yeah, yeah. Like, what if I can't find someone? Like, all of these kind of things. And obviously, it wasn't all that long ago that you just turned up at places. And I think it is force of habit. Like, do you are you able to go out now and just like plot your journey without checking City Mapper? Or well, I I, I definitely like designed for that. So I I, I love. I leave my phone kind of off in airplane mode most of the day in my bag. Um, but, and I feel like as well, it like it does something different in your mind. Like they talk about how back in the day, I'm not sure if any more, but um, taxi drivers would have a much more developed hippocampus, which is among other things, helps you navigate the physical world. And obviously by not using that muscle, then we just never develop it. So if you think about, if you're actually thinking about, okay, where do I need to go here? And you're trying to think of the map that you looked at earlier, then suddenly you're thinking about your surroundings in a very different way than if you just looked at it on your phone. So I, I, I really try and... Uh, Open up to yeah. Yeah, other feelings, yeah. And if I go away somewhere, like go hiking the Cotswolds or whatever it might be, 
then you, you can buy an ordnance survey map, drop a pin, and just get a custom map of wherever you're going for like 15 quid or something. Oh, so that's cool. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a, a good, good hack. To yeah, that's a good way. I'm actually old enough to remember what it was like when you did meet people and there were no smartphones. And if your mate wasn't at the corner of the park yeah. at two o'clock that you'd agreed on a landline four days before, you stood there and you waited and you couldn't distract yourself with anything. You like looked at the sky or your shoelaces and you waited. And then if they didn't turn up, they didn't turn up and you'd just turn around and you'd trudge home. Like, that is obviously very alien to basically everyone born after a certain point and now for the future of humanity. Yeah. But that was real and that was a thing and it was kind of fine. And now actually something I hate about modern life is people messaging you and being like, oh, can we make it 3.15 or I'm 25 minutes late? These are all normal things, but it's just, it never happened. Like, it, and it made people way more accountable. Like, if you told your best mate you're meeting at 3 p.m. on Saturday outside Bond Street Station, you better fucking be there. Otherwise, like, he's just wasted his afternoon. Whereas now, someone will be like, oh, can we do Sunday instead? Like, 11 p.m. the day before. So me texting you saying I was five minutes late, that was Fuming. Like, if you hate you, I bitched about you for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's like. He's like, I'm going to bring this up during the podcast. <laughs> We're going to bring it up. So what, what's been your kind of journey to get to, to here? Because obviously this has come off the back of... Uh, carbon fingerprint so like what what was the journey to that and so, um i think we all started with like acting really um and i went to boarding school uh with my my close mates like we stayed in the same room for like six years so we've known each other for a really long time and then we split off basically i went off to drama school and try and be creative and they went off to university to become intelligent and clever so it was like two different ways and then I had a, my first sort of big role uh, in a, a TV series called Catch-22. Um, it was like directed by George Clooney and it like got a load of press, which was really cool. Oh, it's based on the book? Yeah. I love the book. The book. I I'll watch your TV okay, series. I have to watch yeah. it. I have to watch it, yeah. yeah. Um, the book's great, right? The book is hilarious. It's really, really good. Really, really cool. Well, you know how each chapter is like a different character? Yeah, yeah. I was like, maybe I'll just read my character <laughs> chapter and then that'll be fine. Snowden is right at the end. So I was like... I should probably read the book and it is incredible. But um, so yeah, I went off to do that and I got a bit of social media following from that. And we met up uh, after they'd finished uni and they said, like, how are things going? You must be like, really happy, like really happy with things like social media is booming. And I'm like, yeah, to be honest, I'm feeling pretty like low about it. Like this whole social media world is so crazy. It's such like insane levels of dopamine. And then like you see a couple of comments about your appearance or your, your acting ability and it completely rips it away from you. And then we just started talking about social media and like how it used to be quite a like fun social kind of thing. And then suddenly it just sort of switched into this kind of toxic kind of keyboard warrior kind of vibe. And uh, we were like, well, we should do something about it. We like maybe we could do some things where we work with influencers, where we do campaigns, which isn't for teeth whitening or beauty products. We actually do things that are going to make a difference and it's donating to charities or like doing good and feeling good about yourself, basically. So we built an agency from that. And then we had the conversation with someone saying, we're doing all these amp campaigns, like we're really happy with it. And they said, oh yeah, well, you know how much carbon that's creating. And we were like, yeah, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> what do you mean? And then we basically had an expert explain to us like how much the internet creates so much carbon and like how that's all coming through. And I had no idea about it. And then we were like, well, the fact we need to do something about this as well, like we should bring awareness to it. So it was using my platform to kind of bring the awareness of that and then also bringing a solution as well, where we basically figure out your carbon fingerprint, uh, your sort of social media emissions and the emissions coming from your phone and use a subscription service basically to remove that carbon with projects in reforestation or projects in carbon capture and that's kind of been the journey to that. Was that a really long answer? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's it really good. And just on the data there, what's just so people can understand what 1 million followers or 10 million followers or 10 followers, what is the impact on the environment? I mean, I've said it before in a previous interview, but like when Cristiano Ronaldo posts a photo on Instagram, like it emits the same amount of carbon as like a small city because the amount of energy that's using to go from my phone to your phone to your phone, all these C click cables that connect all around the world, it requires a certain amount of energy and a certain amount of storage as well. Like these data servers are huge. Like the biggest one I think is bigger than Shanghai. 
And it's just basically these big, big computers and the amount of water that is used to cool them down to be at optimum temperature. They tried putting them in the sea and that didn't work. So they have these just massive, massive servers that are requiring so much energy and creating so much carbon from that. And we forget like the internet isn't invisible. There's somewhere that's storing all this information. The only invisible part is coming from here to go to your wireless router and then everything else is actually physically connected in the world. Super interesting. Where where are the biggest? Do you know where the biggest? Thing? I think the biggest one is in Mongolia. So it's like yeah, it's like places where there's kind of like arid, kind of big expansions. But I think they're going to start running out of space, and they're looking to like they tried putting in the ocean and it didn't work, and then now they're going to have like floating ones, and they're constantly. It's not going away. Like that's they can't make it any smaller. I think it's as efficient as it can be. It's just sort of building and building, unless some new technology is going to come out. But it's like the cloud, isn't it? It's yeah. not a cloud. Yeah. Like, Wish. Sounds <laughs> yeah. lovely, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it sounds That's lovely. It's yeah. cloud, but it's... But they're also like, yeah, they're chucking it out into space as well, I guess. So it's just like all angles of all this storage. Um, so we kind of were just like, maybe let's realize that and spend a bit more less time on the phones and try and be a bit more connected in real life. And, and also, to, and like, we're not saying get rid of like screen time cause, uh, completely because that's not going to happen either. Like... It's trying to turn a guilty thing of like, oh my God, I'm spending a lot of time on my phone. But then if you were to work with Carbon Fingerprint and and invest in these projects, you hopefully feel a bit better about that and bring the awareness of it. And if, it's only a small thing, but like if we can all do it, it's a big impact from all of us. How have you found that, Hector, as well? Not having a company that's um, based on people turning off their phones, sort of treading that very difficult balance between telling people, you know, what you're doing is a little bit naughty and like not trying to guilt trip people into it. Yeah, well, I mean, you've kind of just got to look at the, the, what the kind of end result is, right? And it's like, actually, if we can, you know, people are scrolling through social media and if we can get some content up, up in front of them that makes them think about that and, you know, maybe put their phone away for half an hour or even come and stay at one of our cabins and, and do it for three days, um, then hopefully that's going to make a positive impact on their life. And I think... You can go too much the other way where, you know, we could sit in our, you know, we could, we could all go to the cabin and just sit with a tinfoil hat in our head and say we're not going to engage with social media at all. But social media is a great marketing channel, you know? And so actually doing that really well helps us get to our mission faster, which is to get more people offline, like, again, similar. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, you've got to be just shameless. Like we obviously get that kickback a lot, very influencer-led strategy and mm -hmm. people are always like, well, how did you film this video if your phone's locked away? And so, you know, you've got the first point of call. Everyone's like, red flag, red flag, I've got something to say. <laughs> that haters is, you know, extra comments just kind of increase the engagement. So it's uh, all helps. You don't read it anyway, mate. I don't read it, I don't read it. Yeah, yeah, someone reads it. So. <laughs> how do you balance that out then in a similar way to Hector? Like, obviously, yeah, with the marketing for your company and building a company like that. Just Again, it's like, I think we're, we're the, the whole thing that I really wanted to put forward is like how transparent we need to be is like on our page, you have where all the money would go, how the calculation works. And also for me, it's like, we've all said this is like, we're not perfect. We're not saying we're like, we're the perfect green eco warriors at all. We're terrible, terrible people. Like we have bad habits. I mean, I, I'm very lucky that I get to travel a lot for work, but then that's the first thing that people say, like, well, hang on a minute, don't you flying there in this? I went to Antarctica recently and people, the first thing was like, well, how did you get there? I was like, well, I'm not going to swim. <laughs> like, it takes a bit further than that. So it's like a thing of, I, we're not perfect at all, but we're trying to just do something. We're doing our bit. We're like bringing awareness to it. And that's all that anyone can do. So it's like a small little change, I think is the important thing. But you are going to get the people that are commenting and, and, and come back. But that's kind of the way of the world, unfortunately. Occupational hazard, yeah, yeah. quite. Yeah. Tell us about Antarctica. What's the story there? It was insane. <laughs> it was so cool. I was very lucky to be invited by this um, travel company, and they started doing a lot more sort of expedition and philanthropy. philanthropy that word. Philanthropy, yeah. yeah, that word. That, that word. Um, and basically, it was a trip for two weeks to go to Antarctica, and every morning and afternoon, you'd have an excursion out onto the ice, and then in between that, you'd have lectures on climate change, marine mammals um and also seabirds as well so it was like my ideal trip because i love animals and like learning these things and also there's not many opportunities to go to the bottom of the world and the seventh continent so it was pretty testy to get there i mean yeah, it's like 
it's the Drake's Passage, which is notorious for being one of the like most vicious waterways in the world. And I knew nothing about that. My sister, the day before, she was like, have you seen where you're going? And I was like, no, I haven't. I'm seeing these 30 foot swell waves. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, that is pretty rough. And at night you have like a seatbelt that like straps you into bed to stop you like rocking around and everything. So it was pretty testy to get there. And then suddenly you arrive and it's super calm and it's really misty. And then you just start seeing icebergs like go past the boat and you're like, this is sick. <laughs> So yeah, it was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and also the fact that like the researchers and the experts there who are usually stay on these research stations for about a year and they show like the pictures of like how rapidly the glaciers are going backwards. And it was a kind of thing of they were saying that's normal, you know, like it's bound to happen with global warming. Like we have ice ages, we have global warming. It's a natural thing, but it's how quickly it's going. Um, and they used to say like when they, in the eighties, when, you'd hear like a big like earthquake sound and you're doing all this research and then you'd be like, oh my God, you run outside and then the glacier would be falling and that would maybe happen like once a week and then now it's happening like two or three times a day. It's wow. like crazy. Is there anything that they are or you know, they or anyone else on the trip is kind of optimistic, anything that seems to be working or, or is it all doom and gloom? As in what, uh, like they're, they're optimistic about how much they can get out of Antarctica. Like the fact that they have their, all the research which is going into medicine and from like all these particular sponges and corals and like it's such an untapped uh, resource because it's only used for peace and science. You can't do any mineral drilling there. But actually like every 10 years it gets reviewed and I think that one is coming up. But And they're like, mm, we're, we're hopefully it's going to be fine and it's never been touched before. Um, but I find that amazing. Like a whole continent that is basically owned by 12 different nations and everyone's agreed like no, no one touch it. It's all for wildlife, peace and science. And the wildlife is just incredible. Yeah, I can imagine. So tell us, how, how unplugged is it down there? Pretty unplugged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the, the boat had Wi-Fi. Uh, so <laughs> it was, yeah, they, they, did, they, didn't, they didn't have that before. It's because of Starlink now, they were saying. And they, the researchers were telling me, like, to make a phone call, it used to take forever. Like, you'd speak and there'd be a 10 second delay and then you'd hear it come back and like it was completely unplugged and they they're like it, crazy the fact that when I was there it was during the summer so um at night the sunset would be 2 a.m sunrise 3 a.m so, so there wouldn't be any darkness it would be like twilight but then in the winter it goes the other way and they'd just be in the darkness for pretty much six months and the average temperature is like minus 65 degrees so they're pretty unplugged, <laughs> unplugged and in the dark. But they said it's, but the people come back and I can't, I would love to go back. It's a place where it felt so, it's the silence, which is really, really cool. Like you feel kind of like on a moon landing, I would say, uh, where it's just you, the other people on the boat, but then like you can walk across this glacier and you can be there by yourself and you just hear like the wind and you don't hear anything else. And you're just looking out at this vast landscape that's pretty much completely untouched by by man. And you're like, wow, this is pretty special. It's weird because we, we probably think that we kind of hear mm. something close to that. In, in yeah. Place, nowhere near. Nowhere near. And like it was, it was really sad coming back. Like when we were when I was on the boat, like because it takes two days on the at sea to get there and two days on the way back. And like coming away from it, you're like that was somewhere so so separate and so untouched and just silent and now you can start hearing ships go past and like and it's just yeah it was really really special it was really cool so that was unplugged ish yeah <laughs> and did it did it change your perspective when you not change your perspective but did it uh kind of light a fire under you to in terms of global fingerprint like uh just in terms of urgency, like you're hearing the environmentalist talk, you're seeing it with your own eyes. Presumably they showed you like a, how, the, how it's all progressing over the past few decades. I think there's been a, hopefully like a real shift, which I feel, it felt really positive on the boat because they were really happy to have people come there and then also like people like me to hopefully spread like kind of awareness on it and like to another younger audience and stuff. And uh, I think there is a real shift for it, which I'm positive about. Um, yeah, I'm positive-ish. <laughs> when, when, when did you get December? Yeah, yeah. And what what's kind of next for Carbon Fingerprint this year? This year, uh, well, we want to do the club walk now. Now uh, the, the the club started. Uh, we want to do more of that, and it's kind of just more of those community events. I would say, bringing that kind of nostalgia back and and really 
as you say, like unplug and, and separate from that kind of digital world. I think the feedback on that walk was so nice. Like we need to be doing more stuff like that. Um, and we just basically keep raising awareness. Like we're bringing a lot of creators in who are like-minded people who are going to be able to shout about it. And the first thing people say, well, like, well surely you're posting about it. That would be as bad. But as I've said before, like we have to start spreading this message a little bit. And we have this founder, Rob Trezona, who is like head of the biggest climate fund in the UK who's got all these stats and data and all these kind of things that we can be chatting about, which, because I think there's going to be a wave this year, potentially with like the election in the US and things like that, of people sort of disregarding that climate stuff. Um, so we need to be armed <laughs> and ready on the other side, potentially, and, you know, provide the right information that's going to hopefully go out. And what, what's your relationship with Instagram now? I mean, I know you have a pretty massive following. Like, what does that look like? I find it really difficult. I mean, I'm very lucky that the people that follow me, are, like, they're awesome. They're, they're, they're like, 99% of them are all lovely and really support everything that I do. But there are some people who do send the messages, who, which I do see occasionally. And I really try not to look, but it, 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 it just naturally comes up who are just a bit, yeah, a bit mean, to be honest. Um, yeah. And it, and it knocks my confidence a bit. And I, and, I, and I worry about like what I'm posting and if people are going to like it or not. Not like as in like like it, but just even like, who is this guy? Like, what, what is he doing? So like, I want to do things that people are can get on board with and can be part of that community with stuff. Um, but I've been very lucky that everyone kind of been supporting me so far. And hopefully, I mean, they've been, I haven't really had anything come out acting wise for a bit of time. So Hopefully some stuff is coming out soon, which will reward their sort of patience with stuff. I heard a great thing of when you've got a big account and someone, you know, writes something horrible, you just reply being like, get well soon, bro. <laughs> just like, because there's got to be something a bit unwell about you to do that. Yeah. But what, uh, obviously you're like, you've got seven, 800,000 followers, like closing in a million. That's a crazy reach. I mean, can you still like open your DMs and stuff like that? Or does it just get, does it just get a bit too wild? Because I, I, I totally hear what you say. Hector about like you can logically look at someone saying something mean and anonymous online and be like that's on you but it's still you're still a human right so you're having a bad day and like maybe a couple come in on the spin and you're like oh what, what like? And, I, and I think I think I'm very like I don't know data driven in a way of like research like so I need to know well, I need it's bad but I like need to know what the kind of feedback is but then like I mean, realistically the feedback can be very polar opposite of things and I'm not really potentially getting things so yeah, I try not to to, to look at them uh, because there are quite a few, yeah, like just lots of stuff coming in and like I'm not going to be able to read everyone anyway. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's such an interesting thing. Like when I first started out and like when that first sort of big, like 200K people came and I'd been just like filming myself making baked beans on toast and like, I don't know what kind of content this was. Um, so I've been a bit more selective and like I, re I very rarely post now, to be honest, just because... When I do, it opens up that anxiety and it opens up to vulnerability, I guess, in a way of like, if it's going to go well or not. But I can't look at the metrics all the time because there is another thing that is encountered for and that's the algorithm on Instagram. And like, if you're not posting every day, you're not going to be seen by as many people and things like that. So it's all a, it's a um, yeah, complicated world, I feel like. You can hear that in your voice as well. <laughs> Even talking about that, the, the tone of your voice massively changes. Is there a point then, you know, you've got 500 followers, like someone like me, great, it's just like mates and people I know. But do you enjoy, like, do you enjoy social media? Uh, not really. No. No. And why is that? Uh, I'm just the host here, but like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, bring him in, yeah. Nah, I mean... Oh, I, I must unpack this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure many people deep down really enjoy it. Like if I could delete it all... Uh, and still have the same like professional uh, opportunities and personal relationships, then I would do that for sure. Um, that's not to say I can't see the advantages and disadvantages, but yeah, if I could, I'd delete the whole thing. And it's not, that's but the plan. I think, think you're very good at like seeing the positive side in it, but then you guess you're not on it. Well, you're not on it, are you? It's a bit, <laughs> <laughs> but you, I, the way you talk about it makes me feel, I'm like, oh yeah, it's actually really good. Yeah, I tell you what, the healthiest thing I've done for... Um, especially Instagram, it's just, I, I don't touch it, you know? So we have a wonderful team who run it and it just allows me to be a bit more objective. Yeah. So on the other hand, I the one social media platform I do have is LinkedIn. Yeah. We post a fair amount. It's quite good for us because it's quite a, again, it's just quite like LinkedIn friendly content. I have a very mixed relationship with that for the same reason, all, all the same things, you know? It's all that like 
oh, the people going to like this or like getting really excited by likes and then it you know and, and it just it just i find i'm a little more out of whack when i'm when i'm on that a lot so i'm just trying to grow a bit just grow a bit more like i'm actually trying to keep it keep posting on there just having that tick away but grow some distance to it and just be a bit more objective as like this is just a marketing exercise or whatever it yeah. is like spreading the message uh, but it's really hard to do it is hard to do but i you know it just just try and channel that into like unplugging, reading, whatever it is. And yeah, mm. it's tricky, man. Yeah, tough. It is, it is, it's tough. To... It's tough to go. But it can be, yeah, so beneficial, and 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 it can be great. Uh, so it's a real just balance, I think. Um, and I think, yeah, when I was talking about like kind of metrics and stuff, especially now because I have these the two companies outside it, and I'm seeing the the metrics of that, and that is very much like a marketing sort of thing, and I've got to see what's coming back, but then. I use it myself as like seeing my own sort of brand as a person. And that's like a whole other thing because I use mainly, I would say Instagram is for work. I would say it's to showcase the work that I'm doing, hopefully get, create new opportunities and new contacts. And it is a great network of, of different things. Um, but then when you send a DM to someone and they don't reply, you're like, wow, wow, this is, <laughs> this is not that funny. <laughs> How would you see my follow account? Like, yeah, yeah. Come on, <laughs> and just um, pick up on something you said earlier. You spoke about how uh, you're not that extroverted, but then also spoke about how in the early days of acting, you were going to lots of events, like having to talk to directors. How, how did you find that? I hate, no, yeah, yeah I hated it. It was, it was. It's like playing a game. Again, it's like playing a character and like, I found those events really difficult to start with because there are a lot of people who are playing the same game, who are trying to be the loudest voice in the room and create the most contacts and be the one that's going to people go, oh, wow, they're doing really well. So it is a performance in a way, I would say. Um, and I've learned to sort of be a bit more happy and just not, not, not performing all the time. Um, I'm just being a bit more true to myself and not having to be in the rat race of like who's there and who are people talking to and things like that. But it is difficult because, as I said, in acting especially, no one's going to give you an opportunity. You've kind of got to work hard for it and you've got to know the right people. Um, and I'm still learning that now. Uh, you can be very talented, but it's you have to be very lucky um, and you really have to create your own luck at that sense. So those kind of events to start with were, were tough, but uh, and and but like on social media, they look like you're having like the best time ever. So it, it, again, it's it's both both sides of it. Um, but I'm very glad with the, what I've done and what I'm c continuing to do. Uh, and I, I think yeah, my, my my stepdad was a real people person. He used to they gave him the nickname the draft because you couldn't keep him out. Like he was literally like in all the social clubs and things like that, and very well connected. And I definitely picked up uh, a lot of that stuff to be very in lots of different networks and different pies and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Just on the um, environment, I should probably know this actually, Hector, as an unplugged investor, but you, how environmentally friendly are the unplugged cabins? Like, obviously you've got the, you've got the solar panels. I don't want to butcher all this. Like, they're pretty geared that way, right? Yeah, for sure. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, it, conscious that we are putting stuff out into the countryside effectively with the cabin. So, yeah, just, just want to make it as self-sufficient as possible. So, compostable toilets in there, which, uh, you know, aren't for everyone, but actually is a, is a very good solution. Um, solar panel, it's all, it's all off-grid apart from water, uh, just because you know, off-grid waters can get a bit dodgy. And then the cabins themselves are built in a modular fashion. So, in theory, you could take one of those cabins apart and use the blocks to build another building. So hopefully it won't come to that, but uh, that's always there. And there's other trailers, so you can always move it away. So yeah, I think it's like we're, we're going into beautiful natural locations and we want to make it as kind of minimal. Oh, yeah, yeah, as minimal impact as possible, yeah. But it's definitely something we can kind of keep tweaking over time and you know, get into the supply chain side of it, all, all of that kind of thing. Has it changed a lot since your first cabin to the ones now? Uh, not drastic. I mean, lots of... On the surface, no, but like under the hood, yes, like lots of things. It was just operationally got so much wrong with the first cabin. Like we were literally running out of solar power in July. We're like, oh my god, how, how are we going to make this work in the winter? Um, and so we spent probably spent nine months just like messing around with that first cabin, fixing everything that that we broke. Um, so it's just it's just been a kind of constant iteration. So we're changing every every cabin. We change something, and so we're kind of constantly changing them. Starting to really kind of pump them out now. So can start to iterate much faster but it's not about i always kind of feel that the cabin is the means to the end rather than the end itself so it's not about creating 
crazy things with the design, etc. So you almost just want a cabin that just kind of blends to the background. So it just creates that feeling, that experience where they get there and it's just everything they need and you feel like completely at peace and allows them to completely unplug. But, you know, we don't need massive design and turrets and all these kind of things. So yeah, I've, I've kept it pretty simple. Um, and it's just, how do we get a better and better product each time? Is there a temptation to be like, oh, you know what would make this even better? Like an ice bath or a sauna? Because there are some cabins that have got that like attached onto them as, I'm not even going to call it a gimmick because if I went, I'd be like, this is great. But I see what you're saying. Like if you, let's say you got a sauna, you'd be like, well, what else could we get? Should we get an ice bath as well? And then it's, yeah, I mean. You have a yeah. full scale hotel by the yeah. end of the day. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think it is worth like introducing stuff as well. Because like we, you know, those kind of things are the most asked for thing by a mile. So like, how do you balance it, right? I think generally startups, it's just you can just do the same thing for a very long time and like these things never matter as much but you know we will start to introduce these things and just experiment with it you know i think it's like let's do one that maybe is a better setup that can have an outdoor hot tub we don't need to roll it out to the whole portfolio type thing so i think uh the temptation is there massively and not even just that just like completely other types of business like six months in was during a lockdown and we started seriously we're like okay we need to like also reach people they're at home so we like seriously looked into some like at home subscription box would have been a terrible idea we like really really got to mock it up and then ben and i went to weatherspoons on the site visit in henley and uh, we just sat down and we was like what are we doing we just need to smash out cabins like, we've got something that really works here just got to focus on that so it's the constant i think it's the constant challenge with every company is you just adapt and evolve like. yeah yeah you, you got to figure out like what is mission critical and like what's okay this is just like frills Free yeah exactly side. exactly yeah so that that's been yeah tough and you still like also always go off track and so it's just about how quickly you can kind of pull yourself back and focus etc and actually the co-founder relationship with ben has been very good on that because if the other person gets a bit like oh well, when are we gonna do this then you know, it's quite an objective relationship, but that's a stupid idea. So you can kind of shoot it down pretty quick. So I would have done, I would have built a much, much, much worse company if it was done to me. So um, have you ever had a big falling out with them? No, no. We we so we worked together before uh, we were friends. We like became friends uh, working together for trial the job. So we um, have a very objective relationship, very like, unemotional, which is good. So there's never any ego involved. There's been maybe one one incident where it was whether or not we should uh let someone go who just joined two and a half months ago we did end up letting him go probably the right decision i really was against it ben was really for it and we really clashed heads on on that for a couple of weeks and actually in the end i was like whatever happens i know that ben and this guy's relationship probably won't be the same again so like the, the best thing for the business whatever i think is, is to make it. and actually ben was right and you know, maybe the guy's heart wasn't in it. Really good guy, but um, probably the probably the right call. Uh, and so that was the one time. But I think really prioritizing that relationship because the biggest risk in any startup is the founders lose their heads, and the biggest risk of that is they fall out. You know, so I think really just prioritizing that above all else uh, with the team as well. Like it's prioritize the people. Like companies just a group of people. So the relationships between those people are the most important thing. And everything else is a detail and can be figured out, I think. You have you, like a foundation of stuff, yeah. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your business is with your, your mates, right, as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Have you found out like there must have been moments where... I think, yeah, it's, uh, there's four of us in Common Fingerprint and I think it's good to have different perspectives on things. I think that there's a lot of like we're all kind of in the same zone of things but there are different like different opinions and different perspectives Um and I think that kind of helps as well. But it also, I mean, we've lived together for six years and so we can tell each other when we don't agree and we can be quite honest, which I think definitely helps. Um, there's no sort of pit-patting around it. It's like we can be honest with each other and see truthful and there seems to be a resolution and sort of the conflict always becomes a better resolution of what two different ideas, what what happens. So I think it's important to have that. Um, and I've, yeah, I've never really worked not with friends now i think about it <laughs> oh that's lovely yeah and is it that's different because yeah. you've got you've got this you've got your run business which yeah. we haven't spoken about yet is that with different friends or yeah so, well yeah yeah yes yeah. from um some friends that i met through someone else actually um 
and now I've become really close friends from from that, which is quite nice. So like we've, but again, I think it's really, as you said, like those kind of founders, it's important to have a really strong relationship and then build up from that if you're bringing new people into the team and things like that. So I think that foundation is, yeah, really important. Yeah, and then you presume, do you, do you kind of have anyone on the acting modeling side? I have my agent and my manager. I have, I've had the same sort of team for five or six years now. So that feels like a kind of bedrock of people as well. Um, and then, yeah, it can be different when you're going on set and jobs because you don't know what you're going to bump into. Yeah, <laughs> so it's quite good. You've got, you got quite, you've got a good kind of Yeah, there's lots network. of different, like, I would say small communities, which, and like each each avenue of business, I suppose, has a, a strong core, uh, which I can build off and build new people and, and, and build that kind of network and stuff, I think. Yeah, and how do you prioritize? Do you just go with the flow or do you just see what crops Kind of just every day, every week's different. <laughs> I've, I've tried to be like, oh, these two days I'm doing this, these two days I'm doing this. But then I was doing that this week. I was like, oh, January, really good to like have a routine. And then two auditions came in and I was like, well, now I need to prior. I would say acting is always a priority. Yeah. Uh, that takes number one spot. Um, and it's just really frustrating when your agent would be like, we got you an audition. I'm like, great, fantastic. And they're like, oh, it's a day after tomorrow. Uh, it's 12 pages of dialogue that you need to be completely off book for in a different accent. Uh, you haven't got any plans, right? You, yeah. <laughs> you're happy to do that? And uh, so that makes it a bit tough, but uh, it's fun. And it, it, is that then a case of going and just sitting in the dark room and learning it all? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I can pick up lines quite quickly. Um, I usually just, as long as I highlight it and print it, I can pick it up within an hour or so. Uh, with learning lines, you're either like making a statement, asking a question or answering a question. So once you figure out which of those lines is it, you're like, oh, okay, I can. And I usually improvise a little bit, which makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I get the gist of it. Um, but there have been times where my friend and I have completely rewritten all the lines. And then I got a call back and I was like, oh, they must've really liked that. <laughs> and then uh, I went in for a, an audition with the director this was four auditions down the line and then finally met the director and we were doing it together. And then he was, I can as the audition was going, I remember him looking at the script like, and then afterwards he's like, can we, um, can we do it how it's written, please? And I was like, I'm really sorry. I don't know. I don't know how it's written anymore. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't get that job. <laughs> Too confident. thinks he's a writer. Yeah, well, yeah like. exactly. How did you get into acting originally? I fancied the girl in drama class and I thought if I joined that class and impressed yeah. her, then she might want to go out. How, how old was this? Last year. Or... Yeah, a couple of months ago. <laughs> no, I'd say probably 14, 14. Did you, did you get she wasn't girl? interested. No, no. Was just... <laughs> Acting's okay there. Did she, <laughs> did she go into act? No, yeah, no. <laughs> she didn't either. <laughs> well, I, was, I just remember, I was like, this is actually really fun. I really enjoyed it. And like, it was, I was in a very academic boarding school and then going to Brit school, which is like a performing arts school, yeah. was completely different. It was like going into fame where everyone, again, was an extrovert. And I've really, like, over time, tried to be a bit more extroverted uh, without being too much in performance and actually being true to who I am, really. Uh, yeah. But it's hard. <laughs> when do you feel most who you are? With my family, I think. Uh, I think that's always, again, a bedrock of people um, who have always been around and always been very supportive. Uh, so that's helped a lot uh, when trials, tribulation of acting, constant rejection to have these people who really support me and like yeah, believe in me, which I think is a big thing. Uh, you are you're really on your own sometimes when you're acting. You can have your agent and manager, but at the end of the day, they've got 40 clients and, and they, they're there to make money at the end of the day. They, they, they are, they are I'm the, my agents, I'm glad that I've got my team and are supportive, but you are really, you're the only one in that audition room that's going to get the job. And so it's such a hyper intense moment where you're not unplugged at all, kind of, because you've kind of like, <laughs> you've got to figure out how you're going to get on with the director, how you're going to react to these other castmates and things like that, how the lines in your head, um, so it's a really intense environment for can be from five minutes to half an hour or sometimes you don't even get through all of it and they're like uh eh, it's not it's not for not for you and you're like great <laughs> i'm glad i put all this work in <laughs> do you um, want to hear how my acting career go on tell me oh, yeah. i'll tell you mine afterwards uh yeah was in the plays at school had a great like loved it it's a great fun like then uh aged 14 no i can't remember how old it was but i auditioned to be harry potter didn't get it, obviously. And then, uh, and that's, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, 
was it. I auditioned to be Joffrey and Game of Thrones. Didn't get that either. So Man, guys, oh, how did we didn't not realise it's a table of life. lesbians <laughs> this here? This podcast is just us getting our revenge and being snubbed. <laughs> this is that. it. This is it. And do, do you, if you're looking forward, I mean, it sounds like you're very much going with the flow, which I commend, but uh, what do the next few years look like? Like, do you want to really go full on decades of acting or what does that look like? Yeah, I think I'll always, always want to have the, the acting still ticking over and doing things i think that's my like first passion so that will always take number one spot but there's a lot of downtime in acting as like there's a lot of audition processes and sometimes you're auditioning for one role and it will take four or five months and you'll get down to the last two and then you don't get it and you're like you have nothing to show for it I didn't get paid for any of that so hence why I'm doing these other business which i'm passionate about and I'm, i can fill in these sort of blanks and i want to make carbon fingerprint a massive success i want to make hammer rum a, a massive success so it's delving time into both of those seeing what the synergies are between my acting career modeling career and everything just put together and just sort of moving at a, a steady pace is the plan love it mate um what what makes you hopeful for the environment maybe a question for you as well hector like just in general because there's so much you touched on it earlier there's so much negativity and doom and like hopelessness about the environment what what have you seen through your company and yeah, what have you seen that makes you think, ah, oh, maybe, maybe we're going to be okay. Maybe there's enough change happening. I think especially in the last couple of years, I think people, oh, I don't know what you think, but I think there's been a shift of people like they do care and like they, they're they going to care when they're 20 years when they're thinking about having kids or anything like that. And I think that's been a real shift of things. It's crunch time, I think, in, in my eyes. But that makes me hopeful that I feel that people do actually care about it. Um, and it's not a complete thing of, Nah, it would be fine. We've got to do something. Like, I think there is a shift somewhere. What yeah. do you think? I am going to go out and live and say I'm very optimistic. I'm generally very optimistic. But I think uh, I, I think the, the situation now is like, we, you know, it's heading to unsustainable territory. But I'm a big believer in human ingenuity. And although we don't have long, and you know, many people think we're too late already, like we are still talking about years and years and years. And... You know, people are getting worried. Some aren't. You know, that there are there are definitely certain countries in the world that you know, this really isn't on their radar for. And you obviously the the whole world's pulled together. But I think there'll be some amazing technological advances that will help. I think the more extreme and visual and you know kind of tangible the climate disasters are, you know, like frequently now we're getting whole continents on fire for weeks on end. Um, you're getting, you know, fucking East London was on fire a couple of years ago. So it's getting much closer to home to people. Yeah. Some, some bad things will happen in the next few years, I'm sure. Mm. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic that like, yeah, solutions will come and, and yeah, that, that there is still time. And yeah. as Harrison said, I think, uh, you know, people are worried. There's a lot of the very smartest people in the world working on this. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm long humanity. I love it, man think yeah no su um super like optimistic as well i always think whatever like young people want generally happens because they're alive and like so what a 60 year old or 70 year old or 80 year old might think about the environment there's plenty of like 80 year old environmentalists but really you know if you we talk to our parents generation what was taught about the environment in school is basically nothing whereas if you talk to an 18 year old that's just finished school now like it's fucking part of almost every conversation in everything they do right sustainability recycling the environment and young people care and young people want this changed and i think what young people want eventually like if it's scientifically possible then it, it does happen so yeah oh in fact i don't know but either way it's, uh, it's gonna be just yeah it's all right in the end um awesome awesome man really enjoyed it. i had actually one more question you said you've done some modeling as well right a little bit yeah. so like with acting there's obviously a sense that you can unplug and completely commit to the moment. That's like the essence of acting. With modeling, I imagine it's a different skill set just from, from what I've heard. There's a lot of sort of being bossed around. Do you still find a moment to unplug in some method during modeling? When I model, it is, it's like acting for me. If like I, I'll, have a, I'll go in in the morning and they'll show me what I'm going to be wearing. And sometimes I'm like, fuck it now. Wow, this is pretty rogue. This is a bit out there. This is not your usual like trousers and t-shirt. Um, yeah. And I'm like, wow, okay. So I'm like, in my head, I'm like, well, what kind of person would wear this and what kind of like 
I guess, character in a way. So like I put on a like skin where it's not really me. It's like this sort of, again, extroverted thing. And I'll put a playlist on a music that I think will match the sort of clothes and then like get it to blast the music. And I have to have the music quite loud because otherwise it's just really awkward. <laughs> I find it's, I've got definitely got better at it over the years and I can kind of figure out, but this, I watch some models and they go through these poses, like 20 poses in like 30 seconds. And I'm like, wow, that's really impressive. And then the photographer will be like, you know, just throw some shapes and I'm throwing triangles and squares. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's taken a bit of time to get used to it, but I find, uh, it's been a, a lot more fun and like I've been very lucky that I've worked with now designers that I've followed for a numerous amount of years and like it that's an exciting thing to me where when I was a kid I'd have no idea that I'd be working with like Yves Saint Laurent or like Paco Rabanne like these huge big like household names and I'm like you should take confidence from that that they you are working on them and you've been picked for a reason so like go out and smash it basically. Is the idea whether that happens or not? Is it that's the feeling behind it anyway? Oh, mate. Very exciting. Mm. So, where can people where can people find you? Find me, yeah. Oh, Don't honestly. DM him whatever you do. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's nice. <laughs> yeah, Hampstead <laughs> Heath Overground. Yeah, no, I I recommend anyone that wants to come on these the 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 walk club would be I think <laughs> it would be it would be good fun. Um, but yeah, no, I'm on yeah on all the socials. Um, and then Carbon Fingerprint as well as on socials. Hammer Rums on socials. So. I guess it's everywhere, yeah, and a website as well. Love it. A real joy to have you on. Thanks, Perfect. Thanks Thank very you, much, man. guys. Cheers. Cheers. Man. Thanks, guys. Most colour coordinated guest as well. <laughs> oh, white and green. Is the, uh... <laughs> <There's> <laughs> <no> <laughs> <again>. <laughs>